in requests for equipment from the provinces and territories to make. In our other audit, we found that Indigenous Services Canada had not followed its own approach to procure sufficient equipment. As a result, it did not have enough of some types of protective equipment when the pandemic broke out. However, both of these audits also showed ag agility and responsiveness. The Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, and Public Services and Procurement Canada helped address the needs of provincial and territorial governments for personal protective equipment and medical devices. Indigenous Services Canada did the same for Indigenous communities and organizations. Faced with a crisis, these organizations worked around their outstanding issues with the management and oversight of the emergency equipment stockpiles and adapted their activities. For example, during the pandemic, the Public Health Agency of Canada approved how it assessed needs and allocated equipment to help meet the demand for personal protective equipment and medical devices from the provinces and territories. It also outsourced much of the warehousing and logistical support needed to deal with the exceptional volume of purchased equipment. De même, Santé Canada. Similarly, Health Canada reacted to the increased demand created by the pandemic by modifying its management of license applications from suppliers for personal protective equipment and medical devices. Public Services and Procurement Canada also made adjustments by accepting some risk to facilitate the quick purchase of large quantities of equipment in a highly competitive market where supply was not always keeping pace with demand. If the departments had not adapted their approaches to the circumstances, it is likely that the government would not have been able to acquire the volume of equipment that was needed. Indigenous Services Canada also adapted quickly to respond to the pandemic and relied on the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile to fill pre-existing shortages of items in its own stockpile, such as gloves and hand sanitizers. The department supplied Indigenous communities and organizations when provinces and territories were unable to provide them with personal protective equipment. The department also expanded access to its stockpile beyond those directly supporting the delivery of health services to include police officers and people in communities who were sick with COVID-19 or caring for a sick family member. Face à l'augmentation de la demande de soins de santé due à la COVID-19. With the increased demand for health care caused by COVID-19, Health Canada took steps to streamline, streamline its processes for hiring nurses in remote or isolated First Nations communities. Indigenous Services Canada also provided nurses and paramedics to all Indigenous communities to respond to additional health care needs. While the department took steps to increase capacity, the number of requests for extra nurses and paramedics also increased. As a result, the department was unable to meet more than half of the 963 requests for extra nurses and paramedics that it received between March 2020 and March 2021. Our audits of the government's pandemic response continue to show that when the people who make up the federal public service are faced with a crisis, they are able to rally. They are able to focus on serving the needs of Canadians. However, these audits also show that issues that are forgotten or left unaddressed have a way of coming back, typically at the worst possible time. Not as well prepared to face the pandemic as it should have been had the stockpile of emergency equipment been better managed. And if a long term solution had been put in place for healthcare workers, such as nurses in Indigenous communities. 
if there is one overall lesson to learn from this pandemic, it's that government departments need to take action to resolve long-standing issues and to see the value in being better prepared for a rainy day. Thank you. I'm now prepared to answer your questions. Thank you, Madam Hogan. We will now go to the floor and the phone for questions. Please state your name and your media outlet, and we'll stick to the standard model of one question and one follow-up. Operator, do we have any questions on the phone? Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile or maintenant pour poser une question. Our first question, Ryan Tumulty, National Post. Your line is open. I vous la parole. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm wondering, in, in your report, you highlight the problems with the, the national stockpile. Um, you mentioned audits in 2010 and 2013. Was there any work done after 2013 to try to address these problems, or were they you know, systemically ignored all the way until uh, last year? So in your question, you referenced some internal audits that the Public Health Agency of Canada had completed, the first back in 2010. Uh, the department did a follow-up of that in 2013. Um, that follow-up audit found that some action had been taken, but most of the significant findings had not been addressed. When we came in to do our audit, uh, we found again that those problems remained outstanding. Uh, they were items uh, like determining the needs assessment, so how much um, basic equipment should be in the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile. Uh, they hadn't addressed uh, the issue on um, the IT systems, on how to better manage them. So at times we saw that items, um, expiry dates were not tracked and hence action could not be taken. Um, and so uh, those long-standing issues are really what resulted in the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile not being prepared to deal with the increase in demand when the pandemic started. Um, provinces are, of course, responsible for health care here. Was there adequate pump, uh, conversations between the federal and provincial governments over what might be required in an emergency? And, and was there adequate, I guess, coordination uh, of what was in the federal stockpile versus what might have been in provincial stockpiles? Um, so you're absolutely right in your question that provinces and territories are responsible for the management of healthcare services, and that includes managing their own individual stockpile. So each province and territory has a stockpile that they should turn to first in the case of an emergency. Um, they then also have to try and procure uh, equipment to add to that stockpile. When they can't meet those needs, that's when they turn to the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile managed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So at the beginning of the pandemic, what we saw is that there wasn't a very good sharing of information between the provinces and territories, but we definitely saw that improve throughout um, the pandemic. Uh, so they came to the table um, to discuss what was in provincial and territorial stockpiles, what their emerging needs might be, um, how their own provincial guidelines might influence their needs going forward. Um, and so there was really a, an evolution throughout the pandemic, but at the beginning, um, it wasn't as effective as it should have been. Operator, do we have a second question from the phone before going to the floor? Thank you. Merci. The next question, Marie-Ke Walsh, The Globe and Mail. Your line is open. Have la parole. Good afternoon. Following up on Ryan's questions, I'm sorry if I missed this in the report, but I don't see anywhere in the report an accounting of exactly how much, you know, surgical masks and 95 were in the federal stockpile, say, on March 11th, when the pandemic was, um, was declared internationally. Do you have that information? And if so, can you share it? Um, so as you can imagine, our audit started um, in, in 
very recently, actually, uh, a few months ago. And so we weren't able to be present to be able to count what might have been uh, in the stockpile at, in the middle of March. Uh, what we found as we started to audit was that deficiencies in the agency's system were such that it didn't have complete and accurate data about what was in its stockpile. And so we did make a decision um, to, to stop looking at what should have been there and uh, what all those deficiencies might identify and focus on how the government um, reacted and tried to overcome the deficiencies. But it was clear that the stockpile at the beginning of the pandemic was not sufficient to meet some of the earlier requests that were received in February and March from provinces and territories. Thank you. So just to clarify from that, um, there was so little information from the from PHAC that your auditors could not establish those baseline numbers. Going, I understand you obviously weren't monitoring in February 2020, but you couldn't get that clear information in retrospect. Is that what you're saying? And can you explain then if the stockpile was at all functioning how it should have been? So what we found is that the quality of the data was such that we couldn't rely on what um, the, the agency estimated was the stock on hand um, and hence focused on, um, you know, when, when it's bad, uh, let's not focus on how bad is it and, and why did it get to the situation it got to and focus on how to move forward. Uh, what we did see, however, during the audit is there were um, officials had told us and we reviewed documents that clearly indicated that budget constraints had impacted the agency's ability to um, determine the needs assessment, so assess how much should be in the stockpile, but also um, to, to fix its system or to even acquire goods um, as they may expire or be used coming out of the stockpile. So it really wasn't a reliable starting point, um, and hence why we didn't give an accounting uh, of what was in the stockpile before the pandemic. Thank you. Going now to the floor. Thank you. Uh, David Aiken, Global News. Good afternoon. Um, the, before the pandemic hit, the government had clearly already failed, as you've noted, in not preparing that stockpile. That aside, I wonder if you have an opinion about how the government writ large reacted once it recognized it, it needed to quickly procure equipment. We have uh, three government departments agencies. They all responded in different ways, rewriting processes, changing rules. Um, you note that that helped procure equipment, but I wonder if you could put a little color. Was it a good job, bad job, creative job. What's your thoughts about how the government responded, uh, broadly speaking, to the objective of now, we got to find PPE and find it quickly? Um, so you're absolutely right. The National Emergency Strategic Stockpile was not prepared to respond to a pandemic. And that was mostly because the Public Health Agency of Canada had not addressed long-standing known issues. But what we did see was that the government was quite reactive and flexible. Um, and we did see Health Canada and the Public Health Agency, as well as Public Service and Procurement Canada, come together and collaborate. So what we saw was the establishment of um, a long-term uh, long national supply and demand model to estimate needs, which had never existed before, the move to bulk procurement, uh, PSPC took on some additional risks as it moved to that bulk procurement, um, the, the ability of the agency to outsource some of the warehousing to deal with the big volume um, that was being purchased and needed to be managed and then distributed. And then finally, we saw a scarce resource allocation strategy that was developed in order to help determine how personal protective equipment would be allocated when the purchases didn't meet the demands. So when you put all that together, um, that's a, a, a really good reactive response to a situation. What the government now needs to do is be better prepared and have that agility, agility sort of baked into its processes as we look forward to the next health crisis or next national emergency that might be ahead of us. One of the things that uh, the public and uh, parliamentarians often turn to the Auditor General for is the question, did we get value for money? And I found that missing, particularly when we looked at the PSPC contracts. Lots of them were signed. You had some commentary about the speed at which, from date of contract signed to first deliveries. But I, unless I missed it, I didn't see a lot of thought about, or maybe it's outside the audit, did we get value for money? We did know there were circumstances where swabs from China were delivered. We opened the box up and they were all spoiled. Um, you know, there was... 
there was contract, there was, there's language in contracts to get money back for that sort of thing. But overall, it, does your office have any opinion about, did we get value for money in the $7 billion we spent on PPE last year? Um, and that's an excellent question, and, and we will be auditing in detail the cost during the public accounts audit, which is the financial audit of the government of Canada. Um, but I think you have to put yourself back in the context of the market that we were in, where there was a global um, increased demand for personal protective equipment, where the supply was often not keeping pace with that demand. In that market, you know that prices are going to go up. Um, we didn't do any comparisons with uh, provinces or territories or other countries. And what we were um, focusing on was, did the government take the right approach in order to secure personal protective equipment to meet the country's needs? And that's why we focused in on the timeliness as well as the quality of the equipment that might be received and looked at Health Canada's and public health agencies' testing and quality assurance process. Uh, it's really hard to know if you paid the right price because the market here was setting that price. And the, the, the market was such that to come to the table at times, the government had to even prepay. So it really wasn't a traditional market to determine um, a good price comparator. Going now to a second question from the floor. Hi, Stephanie Taylor with the Canadian Press. Thank you. Uh, I suppose it's a bit of a yes or no question, but has the government to date fixed the long-standing issues that led to the issues with the national stockpile in the first place, the, the issues with the data, the systems that allowed it to get to the state it was in when, when the pandemic was declared in March 2020? So if you're asking me today, have they addressed those longstanding issues? The answer would be no. Uh, what we saw them do was work around those issues and shortcomings in order to mobilize a response to support provinces and territories throughout the pandemic. Uh, so there is the need now to, to deal with these issues um, post-pandemic and to, to consider um, how to ensure that there's flexibility. So, I mean, the first place is what's your baseline stock of what kind of equipment you should have? And then um, how do you ensure that you can maintain that? Uh, what system do you need to support it? And how do you ensure that agility and flexibility is baked in to processes going forward? You mentioned that Health Canada and the Fed stepped up to the challenge once the pandemic arrived to get PPE and equipment out to provinces. But early on, we were hearing reports from healthcare workers of having to like reuse equipment and there was, there was such a lack. So do you think the, uh, Ottawa, the federal government, PHAC, responded to those PPE needs from provinces early enough? So early on in the pandemic, if I, I look at February and up to mid-March, there were requests that came in from provinces and territories for personal protective equipment. And the federal government was able to, to address those needs to a very small fraction. They didn't have um, the equipment in the stockpile to deal with those needs, which is why there was a quick movement to bulk purchasing. Uh, the bulk purchases started to arrive in April, so there was definitely a time um, between the beginning of the pandemic and early April where a large part of the needs were not being addressed, uh, but uh, that, that was taken care of as um, the pandemic progressed. And going back now to the telephone, do we have questions, operator, please? Thank you, merci. La prochaine question, our next question, Mélanie Marquis, La Presse. Your line is open. À vous la parole. Merci. Question. Hello, Ms. Hogan. I'd like to come back to the Public Health Agency of Canada. In your report, you mention uh, that there was a lacking governance. Is there a particular person you were thinking about within the agency, or is it something that was sort of systemic? and that was overlooked, basically, by the government. Um, personally, personally, I think that it was systemic. There was an internal audit report from 2010 showing gaps and making rec rec recommendations. Uh, so the responsibility uh, lay with the deputy minister of the agency and the executives of the agency with their 
audit committee to ensure uh, that any gaps were filled and to ensure that the recommendation was addressed. So if a decade later, the problems have not been solved, well, that's when we come along and say, well, there's a lack of governance. But I think it's spread out. It's not a single individual. However, the deputy minister is responsible for all of that, and that has to be kept in mind. Oui, puis je, juste pour, uh, j aurais, j aurais... Question. And I sh should have added this to my triple-barreled question, but do you think that the government's the governance problems have been solved? And then the real follow-up question is linked to um, PSPC. You talked about risks that were taken in advance payment uh, to procure personal protective equi equipment in the market that existed at the time. Have you reached the conclusion that it was a calculated risk that was not irresponsible? Answer. When it comes to governance, I'm not sure whether that aspect was addressed. What I said earlier was that we looked at the situation before the pandemic, saw that the problems had not been solved, and then we focused on what the government actually did to address the problem that was facing everyone, namely the pandemic and meeting the needs of provinces and territories. So when it comes to PSBC, Yes, they accepted risks and they invoked the national security exception, which makes it possible to uh, engage in contracts without a uh, competitive process. They also accepted the risks that come with advance payment. And we noted some recommendations and points for improvement in our report. But in general, the approach that was used in the context that existed at the time with the market that existed at the time was reasonable to ensure that Canada could have a PPE and medical devices. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Our next question from Tom Korski. Block Lock Reporter, your line is open. Have la parole. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hogan. What is the value uh, uh, to date, not anticipated collections through litigation, the value to date of payments for goods that were not received? Uh, so in our audit, uh, we looked at 39 of the 85 contracts that um, public health agency issued in order to secure personal protective equipment that we scoped in. So gloves, masks, gowns, testing swabs, and ventilators. So there are many more contracts in addition to uh, the 85 that were in, in the, the population that we would have looked at. Uh, in our sample, uh, we came across one contract where pre payment had occurred um, and that the goods had not yet been received. But we did note that Public Service and Procurement Canada had already begun to take action uh, to um, recover those funds from uh, the, um, the, the supplier. Uh, as we noted in our audit report, there was about $618 million out of the contracts that we looked at that were prepayments. But in most instances, except for that one that we found, the goods had been received. Uh, forgive me, Ms. Hogan. I was looking for a dollar figure. You didn't answer my question. If you have a dollar figure, please let me know. Uh, problem with your audit. It's contradicted by documents that are on the public record, madam. Uh, we, we just know through, you state, for instance, internal documents noted budget limitations. That's directly contradicted by Sally Thornton, the vice president, who was responsible for the warehouses. She, she said the exact opposite twice in committee testimony before she abruptly resigned. The documents on the public record show that the agency was mandated to store a four-month supply of PPE. That was their job. You don't mention they closed three warehouses. You don't mention they threw away nine million items. And, and you don't mention that two executives abruptly resigned. It, it, forgive me. Th these are all documents on the public record. It's as if you audited the Titanic, but you just picked it up from the part where they served cocoa to the survivors. Do you not see how haphazard this audit is? Did you not look at the documents on the public record? How, how could you come to this conclusion? 
Uh, so I'll answer your first question. I do not have a total dollar figure uh, where uh, contracts were awarded with prepayments and goods not received. Um, it, during our audit, we saw a great deal of documentation and spoke to officials who told us that prior to the pandemic, um, the concerns with the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile had not been addressed because of budget constraints, um, that they hadn't done their needs assessment, um, that they hadn't properly replenished items in uh, the stockpile, um, and that they had put on pause a business case in order to replace the IT system to manage the strategic stockpile. Uh, following uh, the pandemic, uh, we did see that there were large increases in uh, warehousing capacity in order to deal with the large volumes. Uh, we, we ensure that we always collect sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to support all of our findings, and um, I very much stand by the excellent work of uh, the audit team and my office. Going now to the floor. Stephanie, again with the Canadian Press. I'm curious to know, in your assessment, did you look at whether the government ordered based on need? Like, for example, uh, we have plenty of ventilators which haven't been used and which have been sent overseas and, and to province, and we did get a surplus of that. So did you assess whether the PHAC ordered on the basis of need or how they determined where they got to the numbers they did? Uh, absolutely, we did look at that. Um, so at the beginning, uh, the public health agency was basing their orders for bulk procurement on um, requests for assistance that had been received from provinces and territories. Um, and then they, they quickly realized that they were missing information. So they were missing the information of what provinces and territories had in their stockpiles and why their needs were where they were and what the uh, guidelines were going to be in each province. And that's why they developed the long-term national supply and demand model. So there was a third-party service firm that helped them develop that, and it has tons of data that's put in there that uses um, the per capita population, the um, positivity rates, epidemiology, um, as well as um, you know guidelines as to how many masks are needed for certain procedures and so on. And that's what then informed come the summer of last year, um, the bulk procurement. But at the beginning, it, it also was, um, if we need 500 masks and we can get 1,000, let's buy those 1,000. So there, there was a little bit of making sure that we had extra stock uh, in the stockpile. But once they were able to develop that model, that's what really informed um, the decision making going forward. Turning over to your report on Indigenous Services Canada, uh, you said that it was unable to meet more than half uh, the demands for nurses and paramedics from Indigenous communities despite efforts to streamline its hiring processes. Why was the department not able to meet this demand? Well, I think like everywhere else across the country, the demand for nurses was growing exponentially uh, and there was quite a shortage. Uh, but here I would point to really a long-standing issue um, that exists with having um, access to proper health care in Indigenous communities. Uh, Indigenous Services Canada is responsible for delivering the health care to 51 remote and isolated communities. And there were already um, shortages in meeting the, the needs in a non-emergency time. And so the, the surge and increase in demand uh, was such that even though they had streamlined their hiring processes, signed uh, new contracts uh, with nurses and paramedics, they were still not able to meet uh, the increase in demand uh, to ensure that uh, all Indigenous communities, because they had opened up all of these contracts to everyone, not just the 51 remote and isolated communities, and that exponential demand, they just couldn't meet it. Turn it back now to the phone. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. The next question, Boris Prou Le Devoir. Your line is open. Have la parole. Uh, we... Question. Yes, and your report is, is very clear. The government did not know how much PPE it needed in its stockpile. But did I understand correctly what you said in English, that the government also did not know what it had in its reserve? So how, much, how many masks were there, for example? Answer. I think I understood your question. But yes, at the beginning of the pandemic, 
we saw that that p hack did not know exactly what existed in the national reserve because there had been long standing problems identified in the internal audit in 2010 for example the it system did not have all of the data or in fact the data had not all been included in the system there was no follow up on the expiry dates for masks and so without the dates and without a follow up on expiry dates it was impossible for public health agency of canada to take action to know what was happening with regard to shortages and expiry of the, ma the mask. So it was not possible to really go um, into detail with accounting for everything that was in the stockpile. And so what we decided to do was to assess the government's actions to meet the growing demand from provinces and territories. Yes, I also understood uh, that there was progress made during the pandemic. So can we say uh, that now the federal government knows how much equipment is in the emergency stockpile? Answer. The gaps that were identified in 2010 have not been addressed. However, the government has changed its approach and has a new system to manage the equipment that is in uh, stocks that are managed by third parties. So the system really does show that there is a need to invest in a, an IT system that really supports a program. And here, the stockpile is incredibly important. So the statistics show that the situation has gotten better. So yes, the government is in a better position now than it was, but in fact, the, the problems that existed in 2010 have not been resolved. Merci, thank you. La prochaine question, our next question, John Paul Tasker, CBC News. Your line is open, avez-vous la parole. Oh, hi there, yeah, thanks for taking uh, our question. So, you essentially found that PHAC ignored these, these two internal audits about the sorry state of the strategic stockpile. How did the agency's management justify this? Like, what was their explanation for, for basically turning a blind eye to these issues, not once but twice? Uh, did they point to anything other than budget constraints to explain this, which, you know, basically is malfeasance on their part? Uh, so they did address a few of the recommendations. I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. They didn't address, however, the most significant ones, which still existed at the time that the pandemic uh, pandemic started. From our discussions with officials and the review of the internal documentations, the, the main uh, justification or reason behind this was uh, was budget constraints. Um, and uh, and I and I would presume the fact that the stockpile is not used very often, um, but but that just demonstrates the importance of investing in it. If I if I could give you an example, you you don't wait for a, a rainy day to rush out and buy an umbrella. You take the time, you invest. You have the umbrella in your closet, and that's exactly what the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile should be. It's Canada's umbrella for a rainy day. So the agency needs to take the time to invest in that going forward. You, you also found that, um, that PHAC did not track the age or the expiry date of some of the equipment. Do you have any hard numbers on this or any estimates uh, as to how much of the stockpile's equipment was obsolete when the pandemic hit last year? Um, unfortunately, no. What we found is that the quality of the data was such that from an audit level of assurance, we couldn't um, you know, stand behind the numbers that were there. What we did find, however, is that often they didn't track the expiry dates in the system at all. Um, and hence, you couldn't take action uh, if it's not in your system uh, in order to help you figure out how, um, how, how to dispose of them or use them in a different way. Operator will continue on the phone. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, Kristen Hkude, CTV News. Your line is open. Have la parole. Hi there. Uh, how should Canada, Canada specifically prepare for a rainy day ahead? What should be done? PHAC is committing to having a plan 
for the stockpile one year out from the pandemic. Is that accept- acceptable for you? And is this one year time frame adequate or should this happen much sooner? Uh, well, I'm not sure that anyone can predict uh, when the pandemic will be over and what that one year from the pandemic will be. I do recognize that everyone right now is focused on continuing to meet the needs of provinces and territories as we are still very much uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, how do you go about uh, addressing that? Well, I think the, the first thing is that you start off on determining how much of certain elements you should have um, in a stockpile for protective equipment. For example, N95 masks were very important in uh, an airborne illness like COVID-19. That might not be the case in the next um, emergency, health emergency. So you do need to establish uh, you know, threshold of, you know, the baseline of equipment that you should have in your stockpile. Then it's making sure that you've fixed your system to properly track it, that you've properly funded it, and that you've built in some flexibility and access to additional warehousing, additional supplies, um, increasing um, Canadian domestic capacity There's a, uh, to, to manufacture these things. There's so much that needs to be done to be better prepared, um, but it starts with establishing that baseline of what you might need in the stockpile for an emergency across the country. Thank you. No follow-up. Operatrice, est-ce que nous avons d'autres questions en attente? Oui, thank you. Merci. Next question, Zach Vicera, Saskatoon Star Phoenix. Your line is open. À vous la parole. Thank you so much. Uh, Auditor General, I note that your report uh, on Indigenous communities obviously goes through that PPE stockpile that ISC was managing. I'm also aware, though, that ISC provided millions of dollars in funding to some Indigenous organizations and communities for them to procure their own PPE. And I guess I'm wondering, why wasn't that included in this report? And do you have any idea of how that money was managed and whether it met the needs of First Nations communities? So First Nations communities have many ways to get access to personal protective equipment. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they should go to the province and territory first in order to try and get equipment there if they have their own little stockpile that's been uh, used up. Um, when the provinces and territories don't have in their stockpile, they go to the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile. Um, and then in exceptional circumstances when Indigenous communities cannot get the personal protective equipment that they need from the province or territory, they can turn to Indigenous services. Canada um, and access the stockpile that they have there to meet the needs. Uh, we focused in on, on that uh, because it was linked very closely to the bulk procurement that was being done um, for all of the provinces and territories. Uh, you did mention the, um, the additional funding that the federal government had given um, Indigenous communities to buy their own PPE. We did not look at it at this time uh, because the accounting back to Indigenous Services Canada isn't do until the end of this summer. So there really was no information available within Indigenous Services Canada for us to look at whether or not communities used it to purchase personal protective equipment in addition to what they were accessing either provincially and territorially or from Indigenous Services Canada. It seems to me that between the provincial stockpile, the national stockpile, and this other stream of funding for Indigenous communities to buy their own PPE, we really have a challenging time determining how much each community benefited from this, whether they were able to buy adequate PPE, and whether government did its job essentially. Um, is that is the complexity and the kind of interjurisdictional element a challenge here that should be resolved for the next public health emergency that comes around? Um, so, I mean, I think you've hit on something that um, I mentioned when I tabled my reports back in March on pandemic preparedness, and it extends to personal protective equipment. It is that multi-jurisdictional responsibility um, around a health crisis, right? Health is managed by the provinces and territories. And uh, in an emergency like the pandemic, uh, the federal government steps in to provide additional support. And, and that's why we mentioned in that March report, and we also mentioned here about the need for information sharing agreements to be ironed out. Um, you know, and while those things hadn't happened prior to this pandemic, we did see that the provinces and territories and the federal government um, collaborated together in order to address the need 
needs. But this is exactly one of those things that needs to be taken care of uh, before the next emergency uh, because it is complex, especially when Indigenous communities are involved as they play an important role in a partnership in ensuring the health of uh, Indigenous people in Indigenous communities. Opératrice, nous pouvons passer à la prochaine question au téléphone. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, Sherry Noreen Winspeaker. Your line is open. Have la parole. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that budget constraints was one major factor that impacted the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile. Did budget constraints also impact the Indigenous Services Strategic Stockpile? So Indigenous Service Canada had its own stockpile. Um, following the SARS um, uh, pandemic, they had established a policy about how much of each type of protective equipment that they would have in their own stockpile. What we found prior to the pandemic is they weren't following their policy. And hence, they were a little short of certain items like gloves and hand sanitizers when the pandemic broke out. However, if you look at um, cases in Indigenous communities, Communities, COVID cases in Indigenous communities, the demand didn't really hit uh, Indigenous Services Canada in a significant way uh, until the bulk procurement had started federally. And, and so Indigenous Services Canada was receiving 2% of all bulk procurements. Uh, we found throughout the audit that they were able to meet um, all of the requests that they received uh, from Indigenous communities throughout the pandemic, um, as long as they were requesting uh, things in line with the provincial guidelines. Uh, and so sometimes they did adjust the requests, but uh, met all of those requests that were received. Okay, and looking at long-standing issues, um, you mentioned that Indigenous Services had trouble getting nurses and paramedics to meet the emergency demands. But right now, but when there's a non-emergency situation, has Indigenous Services Canada taken steps to address those long-standing issues? That's exactly what we found is that they had not and that when you already start with a shortage of, of healthcare workers, uh, the pandemic uh, makes that gap even worse. Um, and so what we, we found during the audit was that uh, Indigenous Service Canada had streamlined its hiring processes uh, for nurses in the 51 remote and isolated communities. They were able to hire more nurses in the audit period than they had hired the year before. And so we recommended to them that they should consider whether or not this streamlined approach is really something that should be used going forward. Um, you know, this long-standing issue, though, is one that does need to be addressed, and we see it in so many other places when we audit Indigenous services. Um, we would have seen it in February in my audit on water quality, where they lack skilled uh, water system operators. Uh, so it isn't just isolated to healthcare workers, and, and it is something that Indigenous Services Canada needs to address in collaboration with Indigenous communities so that we can fix these the, the lack of skilled resources in those communities going forward. Thank Oper you. Operator, going back to the next question on the phone. Thank you. Merci. Our last question, Ryan Tumulty, National Post. Your line is open. Have la parole. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if, um, if you're planning follow-up audits uh, to this process to see if the uh, public health agency corrects uh, the problems that existed with the national emergency stockpile. So we have so many uh, pandemic-related audits on the horizon, at least in the next couple of years, for sure. Um, it might be something that we look at um, subsequent to that. I know that every department um, is responsible to provide an action plan to the Public Accounts Committee, um, and I would expect that the Public Accounts Committee will also do a follow-up on whether those actions are being taken. Um, but I actually absolutely have on my horizon um, the, the need to look at how to be better prepared next time around. Um, whether that be increasing manufacturing capabilities within the country or addressing some of these long-standing issues. Uh, I just haven't really slotted it in my calendar yet, but it's definitely something I've been thinking a lot about. And then just as a follow-up, the, the 2002 and 2013 internal audits, um, I'm wondering if they were flagged uh, at the ministerial level uh, in terms of the concerns there? Did they rise to that level? And, and were the problems with the stockpile 
raised to the ministerial level at any point after 2013. Um, so I can't really speak to what would have happened back in 2010 and 2013 with these audits, um, but I can talk to you about what typically happens with an internal audit within a department or agency. Uh, the chief audit executive would need sign off on the findings and the recommendations and management to include um, a response and an action plan uh, to, to the recommendations. Um, that would absolutely be given to the deputy minister. Uh, traditionally, you would see the departmental audit committees also ensure that the chief audit exec is following up on not only auditor general recommendations from external reports, but also internal audit recommendations. Um, and so, you know, based on that typical process of what I've seen in agencies and departments, I would expect that the deputy ministers uh, would have been aware of that. Typically, departments post their internal audits as well on their website. Um, I, I didn't go check if those were there, but that would be the typical process um, that would happen when an internal audit is published. Thank you. Operator, final check on the phone. There are no further questions registered at this time. Thank you very much.